Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today as the National Board of Public Health Examiners presents the fifth in our series of six webinars geared to explaining the domain areas of public health to help you prepare for the upcoming Certified in Public Health CPH examination. Each study session will be led by an expert faculty from ASPPH member schools and will focus on one of the five core areas of public health. Each session will be two and a half hours to three hours long and include a presentation, lecture, and interactive segments. A break will be offered midway through the presentation. This, res this presentation will be recorded and archived on the MBPHE website one to two days afterwards. The environmental health webinar is being rescheduled, so please refer to the MBPHE website for the rescheduled date. Um, today's session feature is biostatistics. Um, we are pleased to have Sumi Suzuki here with us, the Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Um, there is a question box on the right-hand corner of your screen. Feel free to key in questions that you may have, and Sumi will answer them uh, beginning at the beginning of the break and at the end of the session. Um, thank you very much, and go ahead, Sumi. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning on the West Coast. Uh, I will be talking about topics for the biostatistics section of the CPH exam. Here's the table of contents for today's talk. I will do a preface and overview of the actual content areas. Um, do you have a study guide in terms of what content areas are covered in the exam? But I will go a little bit into detail about what those areas actually mean. We'll do a section on introduction and summarizing data. That's also called descriptive statistics. We'll have some things on inferential statistics as well as miscellaneous topics that uh, may not fit either one of those categories. So for today's presentation, I'll do an overview of material based on the CPH content outline. This course today is intended to be a refresher and not a comprehensive lecture. So I am assuming that you have taken and passed an introductory biostat course or beyond, and I am assuming that you have some maturity in terms of math, statistics, and biostatistics. For that reason, I'm going to focus on the main ideas and methods and not give much detail about the mathematics or the logic behind many of the formulas, equations, and concepts. So just to go over, you might have gotten this from another review, but for the CPH exam, there are 200 items. Actually, there might be more. There might be tester questions now, but 30 items are biostatistics. Each item is mapped to one area of the CPH biostatistics content outline. So you want to study the content outline and not just your textbook or material from your respective biostat courses because different schools will cover different material. Now the exam is meant to just test introductory level, but schools consider some things introductory whereas other schools may not. All items are multiple choice with one correct answer and three distractors. If you see two viable choices, so you think two of them could be correct, then choose the best one the, or the more conventional one or the one that's more common in your mind. No calculations are required despite the fact this is a statistics exam or statistics section. All answers uh, will be written out in equation form. So that means that, uh, for example, if you wanted to divide $100 by four people, um, and the question says how many would get, how much would each um, person get, the answer will be written as 100 divided by four rather than 25. Keep in mind that some very basic calculations will be required, um, addition, subtraction, but for anything complicated, it would be written out in this equation format. You can download the content outline for the entire CPH um, exam through the link that I have given you, or if you just go into your favorite search engine and um, search for content outline CPH exam, uh, this should be the first one that pops up. There are many things on the exam you may have um, not covered before. 
okay, including in the statistics section. Like I said, schools cover different things. But if you see a question that you've never encountered before, don't worry about that because you won't fail the exam for getting any one or two items incorrect. You will fail the exam for doing badly on a lot of questions. So as long as you show a general understanding or competence in biostatistics, then you should be fine for the biostat items on the exam. So if you take a look at the content outline, you can tell that the contents listed are very broad. They are just either one or two words, and they are very broad in the area. So if you either do a search engine uh, search for that keyword, or if you look at your textbooks for that keyword, you're going to get a whole slew of things under that one item. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of go over each one of those content areas and talk about what do we really mean by one of those content areas. I'm going to label each content outline as BIOS 1, so that would be the first um, content outlined in the BIOSTAT section of the content outline. Uh, it should say visualizing data. So what do we mean by visualizing data? That's somewhat of a broad term. So we mean a few things. Uh, we usually mean graphs and curves when we're saying visualizing data, but it could also be tables. So things you might encounter are bar plots for categorical data, histograms for continuous and ordinal data, box plots or box and whisker plots for continuous data, possibly with outliers or skewed data. Uh, I'm going to cover what some of these keywords that are written here mean in a bit, uh, but those are some of the areas that we cover in data presentation. Kaplan-Meier, this is a uh, terminology you may not have heard before. This is uh, curves done under an area called survival analysis or survival data, and this covers time to event data. Now, as some of you may not have covered survival analysis in your intro classes, I will go a little bit more deeply into survival analysis toward the end of today's talk. For simple regression lines, we mean can you graph or can you depict a linear relationship between two continuous variables, x and y. One's called the independent, the other's dependent. Bias 2 says descriptive statistics. Usually when we say descriptive statistics, we mean some calculated number that gives us a summary of a given data set. We could be talking about central tendencies for continuous data. Uh, those would be some things like mean, median, mode. There are others, but those are the common ones. We can talk about variability, which means standard deviation, variance, the range, interquartile range, as well as others, but those are the common ones you want to know. When you have categorical or ordinal data, it may not make sense to do mean, median, mode, so you might want to do frequencies. So frequencies you can do for counts or proportions or percentages, uh, in which case for proportions and percentages, those are called relative frequency. Percentiles, uh, the definition concept you want to know, um, the main percentiles you want to know are first, second, and third quartiles, which are the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles, but know the definition and what we mean by percentiles. Part of C is standardized scores, and we mean z-scores. So this is when you standardize an observation uh, by subtracting the mean and dividing by its standard deviation. What this will do would create a, a unit list observation because you're dividing by the standard deviation. So when you have standardized scores, you can compare that score across any type of original measurement because you made it into a unitless quantity. Content area three in Biostat says statistical probability distribution. There are many, many distributions, as some of you know, but we mean the main ones. Um, normal distribution comes up a lot. You want to know that the normal distribution is symmetric and bell-shaped that the mean, median, and mode are all the same, and it's at the peak of the bell. Um, you want to know the 68, 95, 99 percent rule as far as how many standard deviations away an observation may be. And you have two parameters, which are the mean and variance, which define the distribution. 
in particular, you want to know about the standard normal distribution, which has mean zero and variance one, or standard deviation one. The t-distribution is symmetric like the normal distribution. Uh, if you recall, we use normal distribution when we know the variance for hypothesis testing, but oftentimes when we don't know the variance, we need to use something else, and that something else is usually a t-test based on the t-distribution. The shape of the t-distribution is much like the normal distribution, but the tails are fatter, so it has a heavier tail, as we say. A categorical distribution you might want to know is a binomial distribution. A binomial distribution means that you have two possible outcomes, something like a yes or no, success, failure, disease, not disease, etc. And you have many observations which can take on either yes or no. And you're counting the number of events or the number of yeses within a given number of trials or given number of observations. Two parameters define the binomial distribution, uh, n, which is the number of trials, and p is the probability of the event. So by probability of event, we mean how often or how frequent does a yes come up. The chi-squared distribution, uh, you certainly want to know the shape and the fact that it's skewed, um, but the main application for the chi-squared distribution is used for the chi-squared test for independence or homogeneity. This is when you have two categorical variables, and most likely uh, it would be set up or it can be set up as a contingency table, and you're trying to determine whether or not two categorical variables are related or not. Another categorical distribution you may want to know is the Poisson distribution. This is similar to the binomial in that it's counting whether or not an event occurred or not, but the difference between the binomial and Poisson is the fact that in a Poisson there is no set number of trials or events. You are just counting the number of yeses or events that occur for infinite number of trials, so over a course of time. It's usually used for rare event. That's a key word that you want to look for when you're dealing with Poisson distribution. So if you hear rare event, that's probably Poisson. The Poisson distribution is defined by one parameter, the mean lambda. Uh, and the mean for Poisson distribution usually indicates how frequent the event occurs. One property about the Poisson distribution is that the mean is equal to the variance. So if the mean is lambda, and then the variance would be lambda. The final distribution on your list is the F distribution. F distribution is shaped similar to the chi-squared distribution, and then skewed. Your main application for the F distribution would be for an ANOVA F test, for a one-way ANOVA or two-way ANOVA as well as in linear regression, you have an F-test in your ANOVA table. Content area four is variables and measurement scales. So this could mean uh, a few things, but what we mean is in terms of can you distinguish a qualitative variable versus a quantitative variable. Qualitative variable may take on many forms. It could be categorical. Categorical means that it has categories of usually three or more. Dichotomous means two categories. Ordinal variable, meaning there are categories, but the categories have an inherent order. We'll go over that a little bit later. For a variable to be quantitative, we mean numerical or continuous. So when we're talking about any number, um, that means a quantitative or continuous variable. So it means that given a range of values, like 1 to 2, then a continuous variable can theoretically take on any value between 1 and 2. Where if, if it's a categorical variable and you have 1, 2, 3, you're assuming that you can only take on categories 1, 2, and 3 and nothing in between. A confounding variable this will also come up in epidemiology, but it masks, it's a variable that masks the true relationship between your exposure and outcome. 
the things you want to know are the fact, well, the definition you want to know, but you also want to know that the oftentimes confounding variables are controlled either through stratification or incorporation in a regression model. An effect modifier. An effect modifier, again, might come up also in epidemiology, but effect, it means that when you have an effect modifier, the effects of the exposure on the outcome differ by levels of the modifier itself. To account for this, the most common way is to put an interaction term in a regression model. You also want to know the difference between the independent and dependent variable. The dependent variable is the outcome of interest. So that is what tells you if your study is working or that's what tells you if something is happening. And then the independent variable is the exposure or factor of interest. So if you're talking in terms of what you come up in uh, epidemiology, the exposure would be the independent variable and the outcome will be the dependent. There could be other independent variables, um, controlling variables that you may include in your analysis, uh, and those will also be called independent variables. But generally speaking, there will only be one dependent variable per problem. Measurement scales. Um, in general, we recognize four types of measurement scales, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio scales. These indicate the hierarchy of information given a measurement. And we'll talk about that a little later as well. Uh, with five, VIAS 5, there's measurement. So the two things on there is reliability and validity that you want to know. Okay? C reliability means consistency of measure. So are similar results produced under similar conditions? One of the key statistics or numbers you might want to uh, keep in mind is Cronbach's alpha that a lot of people use as an indicator of internal consistency. Again, this might be another concept covered either in epidemiology or some other measurement type of course on top of biostatistics. Validity is different from reliability in that it measures the accuracy of the actual measure itself. So what we mean when a measure is valid is does the result actually reflect the true measure? Okay. It's often difficult to know if a measure is valid, but unless it's valid, you don't know if what you're measuring is meaningful. I've combined content area 6 and 12 because it's kind of related. Uh, it, takes, it talks about estimation and confidence intervals. I think for, in the content outline, by estimation, what they're meaning is point estimation. So if you wanted to estimate the mean of a population, you would use the sample mean, for example, X bar. Um, and then in confidence intervals, what we're doing is interval estimation. So that's why I've actually combined the two. Things you want to know from this area is sampling theory and central limit distribution, or sorry, central limit theorem. Um, central limit theorem says that the sample mean follows a normal distribution as long as the sample comes from a normal population or the sample size is large enough. This is a fairly key result that allows us to use many of the tests that we do in statistics. For 6b, estimation of population parameters, like I mentioned a little earlier, this means that you're going to use x bar sample mean to estimate population mean. Right? Because most conclusions we make is about an unknown feature of the population. You want to know the mean of a population, so you do a study. If you already know the mean of the population, there's no point in the study or collecting observations. But we obviously can't collect all observations from population. You can't sample everyone from your city, for example. But what we do is take a sample, and based on that sample, we would make a conclusion about the population. To do that, we're going to estimate some feature about the population, which, called the, which is called the population parameter. And by estimating this feature or parameter, we have a better idea of the population. Okay. The one exception that you might think of where the entire population is used as a sample is the U.S. Census, where we actually count every single person living in the U.S. That would be um, equivalent to sampling the entire population. But in general, when you're sampling, you just take a part of the population and analyze it. 
For confidence intervals, uh, this gives you a range of values in estimating. Okay? A sample statistic, like the sample mean or x bar, gives you one value. So it's essentially like shooting a, do shooting a dart and trying to hit the target with one shot. Okay? So you don't really know anything about the precision of the estimate that you have. But if you use a confidence interval and give a range of values that's plausible, then you have some idea about, okay, how good is my estimate? For example, if the interval is very wide, then you're not that confident maybe about your uh, estimate because there's a wide range of values that your estimate could take. Whereas if your confidence interval is narrow, then you have a pretty good idea of what the estimate is. Okay? And the confidence interval gives you uh, in terms of probability, your level of confidence. That's the 95% confidence interval that you see a lot of times. Seven, eight, and 12 on the content outline for Biostat are all related to hypothesis testing, essentially. Um, statistical test assumptions, these are very basic statistical assumptions. It's nothing elaborate. We're talking about is the data normally distributed or is the sample, excuse me, is the sample size large enough for central limit theorem. Um, level of significance, this is the alpha level that you see a lot of times. Um, it's usually at, set at the 0.05 level, but it doesn't have to be. And um, you want to talk about p-value, which is an important concept uh, when you're talking about hypothesis testing. With hypothesis testing, you want to talk about decision errors and statistical power. And that comes to type 1 error, type 2 error, and 1 minus type 2 error rate is the power. Test for group means, you want to know different tests that you can use to test group means. So you can use a z-test, which means that's normal distribution. One sample t-test, two sample t-test, pair t-test, ANOVA f-test. All of these tests are used to test uh, for group means, whether it be testing a group mean against um, one constant, so is the mean equal to 5 or not equal to 5, versus another two sample test where what you're doing is comparing two populations, for example. Is the mean of one population bigger than the mean of the other population. The ANOVA F-test is used to compare more than two means. So if you have three populations of interest and you wanted to compare the mean between those three, you would use an ANOVA F-test. Test for proportions, um, this comes out to either chi-squared test or test of independence using chi-square, or in certain cases, if you actually have true proportions, then uh, you can do binomial proportions tests using a Z uh, distribution. The other thing is goodness of fit test. This is a chi-square test to determine whether the data comes from a hypothesized distribution, namely the normal distribution. So goodness of fit test is used when you want to determine, does your data come from a normal distribution? Why is that important? Because normality is an assumption necessary for many of the tests for you that you have uh, for it to be valid. For nine, you're going to talk about risks and rates. So we're mainly talking about two things, odds ratios and relative risk, which again you'll cover in epidemiology as well. But remember, the odds ratio is the measure of association between an exposure and outcome. Um, used more for retrospective studies like case control. Now, for the exposure and outcome, you're talking about a two-by-two two contingency table generally when you're talking about odds ratio. So um, you wouldn't use odds ratio when you have continuous data. You'll use it when you have outcomes that's dichotomous and exposure that's usually dichotomous as well. Same thing with relative risk. This is also another measure of association used more in prospective studies, like a cohort study. But again, it will also come from a two-by-two two contingency table in general. Things you want to know from this is that for both, a value of 1 means no association. So if the odds ratio is 1, that means that there is no difference between the exposure groups. Value greater than 1 means a positive association and a value less than one means a negative association. 
correlation and prediction methods. So odds ratios and relative risks can be used when you have categorical data. You want to use correlations as well as other methods when you have continuous data. So correlation is the association of two continuous variables. It's similar to simple linear regression, which you have in B, which models the linear relationship between two continuous variables. Those two techniques are essentially the same thing. The usages are somewhat different. The correlations give you an idea of the level of association between the two variables, where a simple linear regression will model the actual relationship between those two variables. Multiple regression means that it's a, any type of regression model where you have more than one independent variable. Generally, when you use regression, you have one factor of interest, your exposure of interest that's in the model, and then controlling variables, which might be confounders or other variables. And to do that, you're going to include those in the regression model as controlling variables on top of the actual exposure of interest. Two other things, logistic regression. Now, you may not have had logistic regression in your intro biostat course, but it surely has come up in other areas because it's used widely in public health. You use logistic regression when your dependent variable is dichotomous. And we like logistic regression because not only can we use it for dichotomous dependent variable, it is regression so we can control for confounding variables. And on top of that, it will produce odds ratios at the end of it uh, to show the effect of our variables to the outcome. For E, you have survival analysis. Again, you might not have covered survival analysis, but this is another area of set of methods where the dependent variable is time to an event. So time to an event could be something like time until someone dies or time until someone um, is cancer free. Okay? So that time to event consists of two aspects. It actually consists of whether the event occurred or not. Right? So someone who has cancer could never be cured of cancer. That's okay. Um, that's still an outcome. Or if somebody is cured of cancer, then they would be a yes. But on top of that, there's a time component. So how long did it take for that cancer to get cured? If it never gets cured, then um, we say that the observation is censored. Okay? So the event didn't occur, but we stopped observing them. We model survival with Kaplan-Meier curves. That came up in content area one as well. Uh, and then we can compare groups in terms of their survival experiences using something called a log rank test. And again, we will have a small section on survival analysis toward the end of today's talk. Okay, so that's the content areas that you have. And what I gave you are just some of the key words, key concepts, and key terminology that are associated to those areas. So if you are studying the content area, those are some of the areas that you want to make sure that you have um, ready for the exam. So what I'm going to do now is delve a little bit more into the content area itself and break down some of the concepts that are important as well as maybe confusing to some of you. And we're going to start with the descriptive portion of the data. So we're going to talk about the introduction and summarizing of data. And then we'll get into inferential statistics or the actual application of statistical methods later. Okay, so just an overview. Remember what the goal of statistics is. We want to make statements about the population based on the sample. Okay, that's your data. Sample is your data. The population is the largest entity that contains everything that you want to make conclusions for. So if you're talking about child obesity in the U.S., your population would consist of all children living in the U.S. Now, you have to sample if you want to study that because you can't possibly go get a sample of all children in the U.S. So we sample a small portion. And so the diagram that I have below shows sort of the schematic of how statistics works. So you have a population. That's your largest entity of observations that you could collect. From there, you 
uh, get a small subset or a sample from it and you apply some type of sampling technique like a random sample or a convenient sample or whatever to get the sample, then once you get the sample, you can characterize that sample using descriptive statistics like X bar or sample standard deviation. Then we can use inferential techniques to that sample to infer a conclusion about the population. So that's when you do your hypothesis testing, that's when you do your confidence intervals, that's when you calculate your p-values, etc., to make conclusions about the entire population, not just about your sample. The rationale is that if your sample is representative of the population, then whatever conclusion you make about the sample should carry through to the population itself. Okay. So within the process above, we usually do two main things. What we do is summarize the data numerically and graphically using descriptive statistics and graphs. This is known as descriptive statistics or descriptive analysis. Then after that, we try to make statements about some feature about the population after analyzing the data. This is called inferential statistics. We have various methods and techniques that exist for both. Um, but choosing the appropriate method depends on the type of variable analyzed and what type of information do we get from the variables. Okay? So what type of data do we have? So that's the reason there is no one-size-fits-all statistical analysis plan because it's all data-driven or data-dependent. Depending on what type of variables or information you have collected, we have to use a different method to analyze it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about measurement scale because this goes to what type of analysis is appropriate. So by measurement scale, we mean levels of measurement. So these are classification that describes the nature of the information with the values assigned to variables. Okay? So another way to put it is the amount of information that we can gain from each variable depends on what type of a measurement scale we have. We have four um, measurement scales in incre increasing levels of information from nominal to ordinal to interval to ratio, where the ratio measurement scale carries the most amount of information. Okay? A nominal variable are va variables which have no inherent order. So if a variable is on a nominal scale, they have categories, but the categories have no inherent order. A very common one is gender, so male or female. Uh, has no order, but has two categories. Or race, ethnicity, white, black, Hispanic, and other. That's four categories with no inherent order. An order comes in when you have an ordinal scale variable. So a, a variable on an ordinal scale is categorical in that it has different categories of values, but those categories have an inherent order. Okay, so a very common one is a Likert scale when you're asked a questionnaire to rank something on a scale of bad, fair, good. Okay, so you know that everyone knows that bad is worse than fair and fair is worse than good. So there's an inherent order between the three, but they are categorical in that there are no values in between. And more importantly, Good and fair and bad are sort of relative terms, right? Your bad might be my fair, or my fair might be your good. It depends on who you are answering these questions. So there is some ambiguity as to the actual values itself. But no one can question the fact that there is an order. Moving up the scale, you have interval scale. These are usually continuous variables you actually have a true distance between values that are equally spaced to indicate the level of difference in ranks. Okay, so what does that mean? Remember before for ordinal scale, there was no set distance between bad and fair. But if you're talking about, let's say, temperature, okay, one degree Fahrenheit is always one degree Fahrenheit, whether you're talking about 50 and 51 degrees or 90 and 91 degrees. Okay, so because one degree is always one degree, 
this has more information than an ordinal scale where you have an order but you don't have a distance. The, one, the thing that distinguishes an interval from a ratio scale is the choice of an arbitrary zero. So for any interval scale or for any variable having an interval scale, the choice of zero is arbitrary. What do I mean? Well, zero degrees Celsius and zero degrees Fahrenheit are two completely different temperatures, okay? but they're both zero. In a sense, that zero is arbitrary. Okay? So that's why temperature or variable that measures temperature is on an interval scale. If you want more information than interval scale, you're going to have to go to a ratio scale. The ratio scale is, again, a continuous variable. It has equally spaced um, intervals, but there's an absolute zero. So zero, no matter what measurement you're talking about, if it's on a ratio scale, will mean the same thing. For example, if we measure your height, if we measure your height in inches, feet, centimeters, meters, whatever, zero is zero. Okay? One is different for all those measurements, but zero means the same thing. Okay, if you're measuring um, height or anything that has to do with inches, centimeters, or et cetera. So in that sense, height has an absolute zero point. So then height would be on a ratio scale. Okay? Now, practically speaking, it may not be important to distinguish between an interval and a ratio scale for analysis purposes, but I'm pointing out the fact that there is a difference. Okay. Similar to ordinal and nominal. You might analyze it in a similar way, but there is a difference between those two scales. One thing to keep in mind, uh, and this is sort of a caution, when you hear ratio, you think of um, something that's A over B. Right? That's what we mean when we're saying ratio. It's a fraction, A over B, or something over something. We're not talking about a ratio here. We're talking about a ratio scale. Ratio scale is the level of information. If you say a ratio variable, that's why you have to be kind of careful. When you say ratio variable, most people mean an actual ratio, like A to A over B. Okay? An odds ratio is the ratio of two odds, that type of thing. When we say a variable on a ratio scale, though, we're not talking about an actual ratio like A over B, but we're talking about the level of information in that variable. So that's something to keep in mind when you're taking the exam. All right, so those were measurement scales, so the information in a variable. But what type of variables can we have? Um, the main ones are, like I said, qualitative and quantitative. But when you say a qualitative variable versus a quantitative variable, that's not very informative because there are many different types of qualitative variables. Okay? So in general, what we're talking about is a categorical variable, ordinal variable, or a continuous variable. Categorical variable means you have a fixed number of outcomes, okay? usually nominal, like gender or race. Categorical variable with only two possible outcomes are called dichotomous, so that's a special case. Ordinal variable can also be called categorical sometimes, depend, depending on which textbook you use, um, but it has a fixed number of outcomes, but it's on an ordinal scale. So it actually has categories with an inherent order, like socioeconomic status might be low, medium, and high. A continuous variable, usually on an interval or ratio scale, may take on any numerical be uh, value between a defined minimum and a maximum. So for example, your GPA in the classroom might range between 0.0, .0 and 4.0, but it can take on any number in between. So it could be 3.2, it could be 3.75, it could be in any number between 0 and 4.0, theoretically. So given these different types of variables, how do we summarize these variables? Well, again, depending on what type of variable you have, how you summarize is going to be different. So I'm first going to talk about categorical slash ordinal variable and what you tend to do. Um, we tend to use frequencies, those are counts of the categories, or relative frequency, which are percentages of the categories. We can present these in table format, or we can graph them on a bar chart. Okay, here's a very simple example 
um, an artificial, no, I think this is a real example from some source, but it's an example. You have six leading causes for a child aged one to four to visit an emergency room, and they are be, uh, falling, being struck by something, something environmental, poisoning, cuts, and car accidents. And if you get, uh, gain information from a thousand children, you get the following frequency. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, number of cases for every 1,000 children. You get the following frequency. The relative frequency is just a frequency divided by the total count there. So we present it in a uh, table in the previous page, but we can also present it as a bar chart. Okay? We could have plotted relative frequencies on the vertical axis instead of the actual counts, in which case you would be graphing proportions or percentages. Either is okay. The whole idea is to show that you have many more falls than any other things here, for example. What do we do with continuous variables? Continuous variables, um, can't, well, you really can't use a bar chart like before because there's theoretically infinite number of possible outcomes. So what we can do is use some type of a dis, uh, statistic, a calculated measure, um, things that measure central tendency. This is the center of the population. So what is a typical value for the population? And we can estimate the central tendency using sample mean, sample median, or sample mode. Okay? The mean, remember, is just the average of your samples. The median is the middle value of the sample. So that differs depending on whether you have an odd number of observations or even number, but it's still the middle of the observation, middle of your data. And it's also the second quartile. The mode of the distribution mode of your sample is the most frequent value. Okay, so which observation do you see most? The mode does not have to be unique, so you can have multiple values that appear the exact same number of times. Central tendency tells you what happens in the center of the population. Variability tells you how spread out your values are in the population. Okay? Sample statistics for variability are standard deviation, variance, range, or interquartile range. Those are the main ones. Standard deviation is spread from the mean and original units, so how far are your observations with respect to the mean? Variance is um, that same spread in squared units. The range is your maximum minus minimum, and your interquartile range is the third minus the first quartile. So that's what's, ha what's the spread in the middle. Okay, variability is important because if you have high variability, it means that you have a lot of observations away from the mean. So the mean may not mean as much. Whereas if you have a small standard deviation or variance, then that means a lot of your observations are toward the center, so they're clustered toward the center. How do we graphically summarize continuous variables? Uh, we use histograms rather than bar plots. So with histograms, we're dividing our data into range of values. So for the example I have on screen, um, this is 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70. And you're counting the number of observations that fall between those intervals. And then you're either graphing the frequency or the relative frequency like you did with the bar plot. What does a histogram help you do? It helps you determine the shape of the data. That's important because remember one of the key assumptions of many of the tests is normality. So if your histogram doesn't look like a bell curve or shape, then your data might not come from a normal distribution. Okay. Shape determines which numerical summary to use. Okay. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. Here are some common shapes for histograms. You have a normal distribution or symmetric distribution where you have one peak and you have a, a bell curve you can have something that's positively skewed or negatively skewed. Positively skewed means that you have um, more observation toward the beginning and less observation toward the end. Negative skewed means that you have more observation toward the end and you have less observation at the beginning. Okay. If you're going to use a measure of central tendency, for example, mean, median, or mode, 
the best one depends on your shape of your distribution. So in the second graphic below, I show where your typical mean, median, and modal fall for skewed distributions and normal distribution. So as you can see in the center there, for a normal distribution, the mean, median, modal all coincide. So it really doesn't matter which one you use. But for negatively skewed distribution, the mean would actually be before the median. And for positively skewed distribution, the mean would be after the median. Right? So if you just use the mean and you have a skewed distribution, that might not actually be a measure of central tendency because of the skewed distribution. In which case, you may want to use the median because the middle is always going to be, or I should say most of the time, going to be more robust in that it will capture the middle um, more often than not. Okay. And this just summarizes what we just said. So if it's symmetric, mean and median are the same. But if it's right skewed or positively skewed, the mean would be greater than the median. Negatively skewed, mean would be less than the median. Okay. So if you suspect the skewed distribution, you may want to think about using the median rather than the mean. Because the median is less affected by outlying observations. Those are observations toward the extreme end, either really high or really low. And so if the underlying distribution is not symmetric or you think there's a chance that outliers might influence your central tendency, then you want to use the median instead of the mean. Okay, but the mean is preferred a lot of times because that's how our analysis are based. Our, our inferential statistics a lot of times are based on analyzing the mean. So if skewed, um, or if there are outliers, what else can we do other than histogram? Uh, what we can do is something called a box and whisker plot, or sometimes it's just called a box plot. Box plot has five pieces of information. It will have a box in the middle with a line in the middle. That line in the middle will indicate the median. The either ends of the box will indicate the first and third quartiles of your data. And then you usually draw a line coming out of the box toward either end where toward the positive side the line will end where the maximum value is and toward the negative end your line will end where the minimum value is. Okay? And so the difference between the third and the first quartile is the interquartile range. And it also show the minimum and the maximum. If you have skewed distributions, then your box plot may look like the one I have below. Where normal distribution, again, the median would be in the middle. Positive skew, medium might be slightly shifted to the left negative skew, it might be slightly shifted to the right. Okay. And box plots can also be written vertically, but the components will still be the same. All right. A few more descriptive statistics that you want to know. Uh, we talked about percentile. The percentile, or the kth percentile, is the value at which k percent of the observations fall below. Okay. So, for example, if you scored in the 90th percentile on a test, that means that you did better than 90% of the people who took the exam. The common ones are first, second, and third quartiles, which correspond to the 25th, 50th, and the 75th percentiles, respectively. Okay, so the descriptive statistics are very nice in that it gives you sort of a picture of what's happening with the data, and it kind of gives you an idea about the type of conclusions you might or may be able to make. But really the strength of statistics and, the, and the why we use statistics is in the inferential statistics to make conclusions about the population. So let's go over that a little bit more in detail. Many, as I've been saying, many of the analytical methods that you're going to use in statistics are based on the normal distribution or the assumption of normal distribution. Okay? So that's one of the underlying assumptions for the population. And normal distribution, if you were to graph the entire population, should look like a bell curve. 
So if you were to graph the relative frequencies of the entire population, it would look like a bell curve. Normal distributions apply to continuous data because it has to be able to take on any value between any interval. So um, it doesn't really make sense to talk about normal distribution for categorical data, um, and that's why we have different ways to analyze categorical data. Some properties about the normal distribution, we've already been saying mean equals the median equals the mode. Okay. Some other things that you want to realize that it's symmetric about the mean or the median or the mode. So the area to the left of the mean is 0.5 and area to the left is, oh, sorry, area to the right of it should be 0.5 and area to the left of it should be 0.5. There's a typo there. Um, why 0.5 and 0.5? Remember, because the normal distribution or any type of a distribution curve, the area under it represents the probability. So if you were to take a normal curve and calculate the probability between any two intervals or the area under the curve between those two intervals, that's the probability of an observation coming from that population belonging to that interval. With the normal distribution, we have a property about those probability in that 68% of the values from the population fall between one standard deviation of the mean. Okay, so that's 34% on each side of um, the mean, in this case zero, or uh, 68 total. 95% of the values fall within two standard deviations of the mean. Okay, that's why there's 13.5 on either side of the 34 because that total will come up to 95%, and then 99% of all values fall within three standard deviations, and the remaining 1% fall um, three, more than three deviations, standard deviations away from the mean. When we know we have a normal distribution, um, we can use it to calculate other things, for example, z-score. A z-score uh, is a, a quantity calculated by taking your observation from a normal distribution, subtracting the mean, and dividing it by its standard deviation. What would this do? Well, this will make z into a standard normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1. Why is that? Because you're subtracting the mean, which means that you're shifting the center to 0, and then you're dividing by the standard deviation to make the shape of the curve similar or same as a standard normal distribution. So this Z transformation or Z score transformation creates a quantity called Z score or standardized score. And so we can transform any normal variable that we have into a standard normal variable. Okay? Even if the distribution is not normal, though, a large sample size guarantees that a sample mean is normal. Why is that important? Because by standardizing the sample mean, then, we can get the standard normal distribution because, again, for larger sample sizes, you'll have normal distribution. This type of standardization is important because this is how we create the test statistics for our hypothesis tests. Okay, so we're going to take a break, uh, about a 15-minute break um, after this, but at this time I will entertain any questions you might have from the first half of this talk. Let me see if there are any questions for you soon. Um. Whenever questions are entertained for properties of normal distribution, where was the error on the slide? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you talk about the within one standard deviation, 68% again? Sure. Um, let me go back to that slide. Okay. So I hope you can see my mouse clicking over the, the graph. But zero here is the mean of this distribution because that 
corresponds to the highest point, the center of the normal distribution. These plus one minus ones indicate how many standard deviations away from the mean it is. Okay, so this plus one would indicate the quantity that's one standard deviation away from the mean. So that's mean plus one standard deviation. Likewise, minus one is mean minus one standard deviation. Within this interval from minus one standard deviation to plus one standard deviation, 68% of all values in the populations um, lie. So you have 68% chance that an observation from your population will fall somewhere between these um, intervals. If you want to increase that probability or chances to cover more, then you go out two standard deviations. And within these two standard deviations, you have 95% of the observations. Okay? So that's why it's 13.5 and 13.5, which makes uh, 27. 34 and 34 is 68, so 68 plus 27 is 95. Okay? Then an additional 4% or 99% total lie between three standard deviations. So from minus 3 to plus 3, that's where 99% of all observations in the populations are going to lie. Okay? So there's a 99% chance that if you sample from a population, your observation will be somewhere in here there is an additional 1% chance that it might fall below, but that's a very low chance to be out here or out here. Okay? Okay. Um, if there are outliers, which one is better, mean or median? So, good question. So, for mean and median, uh, if you have an outlier, the general rule of thumb is you want to use a median because if you have an outlier, it will significantly affect the mean usually. So I can give you an example. If you go in and everyone's cholesterol level is about 150, so you have 20 people whose cholesterol level is 150, but you have someone whose cholesterol level is very high, like 250 or even 300, then the central tendency you want to think is about 150 because everyone has a mean of 150, but when you calculate the mean, it'll be higher because that one person who has um, the 300 cholesterol level. But if you're talking about the median, that won't change. It'll always be 150 because um, whether there's an outlier or not, the middle stays the same. So in general rule of thumb, um, if you have an outlier, or any situation where you think the mean doesn't capture the middle as well, then you want to use the median. Um, I don't see any other questions, but just to let everyone know, these slides will be posted on the website and the recording as well. Okay, so then it's about uh, 2 o'clock Eastern. So let us resume at 2.15 Eastern.
Okay, let us go ahead and resume. So when we left off, we were talking about inferential statistics. We talked about normal distribution and z-score. And so let's talk about the type of statistical inference that you can do. The main ones are estimation and hypothesis testing. Both have different purposes and you would use it for different situations. So with estimation, the purpose is to estimate a feature of the population. So that's the parameter. Once again, descriptive statistics gives us point estimates. So that's just one number. Um, but we can use a confidence in interval to give an indication about precision. How confident or how sure are we about that uh, estimate that we just have? Hypothesis testing, what we do is we start with some statements about a parameter, two contradicting statements about a parameter. And we use the sample data to determine whether the statement can be rejected or not, whether the statement is, um, is false. In general, a confidence interval and hypothesis tests have equivalent information. We use the same data with the same concepts. Okay? Um, you'll know it as if the null value, value under the null hypothesis, is in the confidence interval, then the test will not reject. Okay? But because it has two different purposes, people will use one for estimation and one for testing purposes. All right, so let's talk about confidence intervals first. Um, think about confidence intervals as a set or range of values that are plausible estimates for the parameter. So once again, that point estimate, x bar, only gives you one number, but with an interval it gives you a bunch of numbers that it could uh, take on. So practically speaking, uh, a 95% confidence interval for the mean might be, let's say, 10 to 15. So that means that any value between 10 to 15 are, quote, good estimates for the population mean. Okay. Um, however, um, I think you were stressed this point in your intro classes, technically that um, interpretation I gave, gave is not correct. Okay. What's, what's not correct is that um, statistics is about long run results or long run probability. So we can't really definitively say that the confidence interval that we have based on our data actually has is a good or estimate or not or does it even contain the population mean. What we can say with this 95 percent is that if we were to do similar confidence intervals repeatedly forever then we have the assurance that the 95 percent of those intervals will actually cover the true population mean or the parameter of interest. But we have no way of knowing whether or not our confidence interval that we calculated covers the mean or not. So the example I have down here, think about all the blue lines that I have, the vertical blue lines that I have as confidence intervals that every single one of you calculated. So every single one of you calculated a different confidence interval and this is going to happen because although we're all sampling from the same population, our samples are going to be different. Right? You might have a different group of people than I have, in which case our confidence intervals will be different. How do I know my confidence interval is better or worse than your confidence interval? I don't. We don't. Uh, and we never know that. The only assurance we have is that with all of our confidence intervals, right, the bunch of them that we've done, 95% of them would actually contain the sample mean. Whether yours is one of those 95%, we won't know. So as you see in the blue line examples below, some lines don't contain that red dotted line, which is the parameter of interest. Most of them do. Okay? You have no way of knowing which one is your line, um, but we do have the assurance that we're doing the right thing in terms of if we were to do this repeatedly, 95% um, of those would actually cover the mean. In hypothesis testing, uh, especially in public health, this is the most common class of statistical inference. We see this a lot. What we do is start with two contradicting statements and try to find evidence against one in favor of the other. These two statements are called the null hypothesis, denoted by h sub zero, 
and the alternative hypothesis denoted by either H sub 1 or H sub A. What we're going to do is, based on the data that we collected, we're going to decide whether there's enough evidence or data to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. When you do this, um, you're going to have to make a decision. Okay? So how do we make a decision? Well, the decision is going to lead to four possible scenarios. So on the left-hand column where I have H0 is true and HA is true on this table here, that is the true state of nature. So you've made contradicting statements like um, the mean is greater than 5 versus mean is less than 5. Right? Those are contra well, let's just say greater than or equal to 5 or less than 5. Those are contradicting statements. One of them is true. They can't both be true. Okay? So you don't know which one is true because if you did, there's no point in doing the test. There's no point in collecting data. You already know the answer. So in general, the first column, you don't know, but one of them is true. Okay? So suppose the null hypothesis is true. Again, which you don't know, but suppose it's true. Well, you're either going to reject the null hypothesis or not reject. So this top column here, this top column here, or sorry, top row here, this is your decision. You can either choose not to reject or reject the null hypothesis. If you don't reject and null hypothesis happens to be true, then you're correct. There's no mistake here. However, if you reject, and the null happens to be true, you've made an error. That error is called the type 1 error. Likewise, if the alternative is true and you reject, you made the correct decision because the alternative is true and you rejected the null hypothesis. But if you don't reject but the alternative is true, then you've made an error and this is called type 2 error. These are the four scenarios that could occur when you do a hypothesis test. However, again, you never know which quadrant you fall under because we don't know whether the null is true or the alternative is true. Okay? So what confidence do we have that we're making the right decision? Well, what we do is classify error rates. So we have type 1 error rate. That is how often type 1 error occurs. Um, and we denote that as Greek letter alpha. Type 2 error rate is how often does type 2 error occur, and we often denote this as Greek letter beta. The rate at which a test correctly rejects is known as the power, and this is 1 minus beta. Now, so alpha and beta are probabilities, so 1 is the total probability, and the power of the test is correctly rejecting, so it's how often don't you make a type 2 error. That's why we're subtracting beta. So how do we go about testing? So we first construct the null and an alternative hypothesis based on your parameter of interest. Again, for example, mu is equal to 5 versus mu not equal to 5. Right? Mean is equal to 5 versus mean not equal to 5. Then what you do is you assume an acceptable rate at which type 1 error can occur. So this is the type 1 error rate that you are OK happening. Right? You can't be perfect because we don't know the truth. But you pick a level where you're OK making a type 1 error this much percentage of the time. This is called the significance level of the test. And almost universal value that's used is alpha equal 0.05. So what we're saying is we are OK making a type 1 error 5% of the time when the null hypothesis is true. After the significance level is cho chosen, we choose an appropriate test. And again, remember the test depends on what type of variables you have and what type of information you have. We construct the test statistic, usually compute a p-value, and then compare the p-value to your um, specified alpha level and make a decision. So what is this p-value? Um, formally, p-value is the probability to observe a value of the test statistic at least as extreme as what is actually observed. Okay? 
here extreme is often used to represent evidence against the null. So this definition is somewhat confusing. The p-value is used to measure the significance of the test. So is there enough evidence against the null to reject it? So p-value is a probability. What it tells you is supposing that the null hypothesis is true, then how likely or not likely are you to see an observation that you observed or more extreme? So for example, you observed that x bar was 10. That's your observation. So p-value would indicate if the null hypothesis is true and the mean is, let's say, 5, the null hypothesis that the mean is 5. Under mean being 5, how likely are you, are you to see a sample mean of x bar equals 10 or higher, more extreme? Okay. Based on that probability, we make a decision. Okay. So the test is said to be significant um, if there's enough evidence to reject the null. This happens when the p-value is smaller than the alpha level. So if the p-value that you calculate is smaller than your predetermined alpha level, often 0.05, then you have enough evidence against the null to reject it. In which case, the test is said to be significant. But if you don't have enough evidence and your p-value is greater than 0.05, then the test is said not to be significant. Okay. Some misconceptions about p-value. Again, p-value is a fairly abstract concept because you're not calculating the probability of observing what you did, but it's the probability of observing what you did or more extreme, right? And so that's where some of the confusion um, comes from. But just to clear up some misconception, a p-value merely indicates the chances of the result you saw whenever null is true, okay? A low p-value means either that the null is true and a highly improbable event just occurred, or that the null is false. Okay, nothing more, nothing less. The deduction of rejecting the null hypothesis comes from us, right? Because when the p-value is low, it could either be that the null is in fact true and we just observed something rare, or that the null is false. That's why we're getting these extreme results. We don't know which one is true, okay? But what we're doing is saying, okay, I'm in... Uh, concluding that the null is false because there's enough evidence and it's probably not the situation that a rare event has occurred. Okay, so because of this, the p-value is not the probability of making a type 1 error. And it does not indicate the size or importance of the observed effect. Okay, so you might have read some papers or research articles that says our p-value was very small and it was highly significant. Okay, that doesn't make the result any more important because the only thing p-value does is indicate under the null hypothesis how likely or unlikely the event is. It doesn't tell you how likely the alternative hypothesis is. Okay, that's where the mistake happens a lot of times. All right, so now that we know sort of the way you conduct a test, how do you choose the correct statistical method. Okay, so the fundamental question you should ask whenever you're conducting any statistical test is which test should I use? And the answer depends usually on the type of the dependent variable and oftentimes the type of the independent variable as well. Okay, um, as well as the answer depending on the parameter of interest. So for example, in testing whether two group means are different, we can think about this in one of two ways. You can think about it as the dependent variable is continuous and the independent variable is dichotomous. You have two groups, okay? So you have some variable indicating which group you belong to and then the dependent variable is some continuous measure. Or another way you can look at it is you have two parameters, mean of the first group and the mean of the second group. These are the theoretical means that you don't know, the mean of the population. Okay. Then we would test the null hypothesis that mean 1 equals mean 2. Okay. Either way, the correct test is a two-sample test of means. 
So when we're talking about test for group means, okay, the scenario is that you want to know if there's a difference in population means between several groups. If you only have two groups and the population variance is no, you use a two-sample z-test. Now, the population variance being known is somewhat rare, but if you do know it, you can use the z-test or the test based on the normal distribution. If you only have two groups but the population variance is unknown, use a two-sample unpaired t-test. Okay. And if you have more than two groups, use ANOVA F test. And for all tests, the null hypothesis is that the group means are the same versus the alternative that at least one group mean is different. All right, what if you have proportions instead? So the scenario might be you want to know if the frequency of categories in one variable depend on the categories of another. Or you want to know if the distribution of a categorical dependent variable is different based on levels of another categorical independent variable. Okay? So for example, I have um, ethnicity, race ethnicity versus hemoglobin um, levels, and I've categorized hemoglobin into less than 9, 9 to 9.9, .9, and greater than or equal to 10. Okay? So the table, this 3 by 3 contingency table, shows us the frequency at which the combination of variables occurred. Okay? And a question might be, is race and HEVOGO levels independent or are they associated? Your null hypothesis would be that the variables are independent, so hemoglobin level and race will be independent or there's no association. The alternative would be that the variables are dependent or associated. Okay, you might hear either words, association or independence. What you would use is a chi-square test and statistics computed from observed and expected counts. The degrees of freedom of the test is number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. That's the R and the C. Same test may also be called test for homogeneity. So test for independence and test for homogeneity, the statistics side is the same. Your interpretation is a little different. In test of homogeneity, you're saying is the distribution of um, hemoglobin levels different between the various races. Whereas for test of independence, you're saying is there an association between race and hemoglobin levels. Either way, the test will be conducted in the same way. Um, goodness of fit test. This is often used to test whether or not the distribution that you're dealing with uh, from the population is normal or not. It's an application of the chi-square test. Um, the scenario is you want to know, does the sample you have come from a hypothesized distribution? Okay. So a simple example would be if you have a uh, dice or die, and it's six-sided, you want to know if it's fair. Okay? If it's fair, um, any numbers one through six should, observe, should be observed in equal numbers or close to it. Okay? So what you're going to do is co compare the observed counts that you have of the die versus the expected count uh, using a chi-squared test. Okay? So this would be um, an application of the goodness of fit test, but a very elementary one. A more practical one would be for continuous data. You would divide data into intervals, then compare observed and expected using chi-squared tests. So this can be used to test whether or not sample comes from a normal distribution. Okay, measures of association. So two common questions when doing analysis are, is there an effect? and if so, how much? For continuous independent and dependent variables, we use correlation, right? That correlation will tell you if there's an effect, and if so, how much? For dichotomous independent and dependent variables, use either relative risk or odds ratio. So correlation. Correlation indicates the strength of linear relationship between two continuous variables, okay? The parameter that you're estimating is called the correlation coefficient. 
which ranges between negative 1 and 1. A correlation coefficient value of 0 means that the two continuous variables are uncorrelated or there's no association. If it's positive, then variables are positively correlated. That means that as one variable goes up, the other goes up. So height and weight might go up together. Um, if it's negative, then variables are negatively correlated. So then um, if one variable goes up, the other variable goes down. Although um, we use correlation and simple linear regression in different applications, the actual fundamental statistics are the same. So you can get every result you get from correlation using simple linear regression uh, and vice versa. The graph shows a very crude picture of what happens for positive correlation, negative correlation, and no correlation. So if it's positive correlation, there is usually an upward trend as x increases, y increases. And if there's negative correlation, there's a negative trend or a downward trend. If there's no correlation, then the data would be everywhere. As x goes up, then y will, y will do its own thing and vice versa. All right, so if you have two dichotomous variables, dependent and independent, then you can set that up as a two by two contingency table. Okay. As we talked about, relative risk can be used a lot of times with perspective studies. Uh, it indicates the ratio of risk of getting the disease with the risk factor versus risk of getting the disease without the risk factor. Okay. Um, from a two by two contingency table, the relative risk can be calculated pretty easily, um, where your two by two contingency table shows how many people are at risk and how many people have the disease. Now, risk factor can be anything like behavioral patterns or genes or whatever. Outcome can be anything from like obesity to heart attacks, things like that. But in any case, you can calculate the relative risk in the following manner. Just a, a bit of advice, um, don't remember the formula per se, but remember what the relative risk means because sometimes contingency tables may not be written as I have written it. It might be written where the risk factor and the outcomes are switched, okay? or it may be written in text format where there is no table given but the values are given. But if you remember or if you understand the concept of relative risk, the numbers that you need should be easily extracted. Whereas if you're remembering the relationship between A, B, C, and D, then you're going to have a harder time remembering it. So the advice for a lot of these things is think conceptual rather than formula or equation. Similarly, for an odds ratio, uh, you're going to have a similar setup, but an odds ratio is the odd, it's the ratio between two odds. So odds of having the disease with the risk, odds of having the disease without the risk. Okay? And odds is the probability of um, success divided by the probability of failure. So P over 1 minus P. Okay. Interpretation. So odds ratio and relative risk are interpreted in the same way or similar way. Um, if 1 is the value of the relative risk or odds ratio, okay, then there's no association. Greater than 1 means there's a positive association. So a positive association means that if you do have the risk factor, your odds or your risk increases. Less than one means a negative association, meaning if you have the risk factor or the protective factor, then your odds or risk of the disease is lower. Okay? But those are point estimates, right? So if you get an odds ratio or relative risk from the table, then that's just your point estimate for those values. So to create, uh, or to talk about precision, you need a confidence interval. And for a confidence interval, for both, if the value of 1 is included in the confidence interval, then the OR or relative risk is not significant. Whereas if 1 is uh, not included, then it is significant. So for example, an OR of 1.5 with the CI of 1.2 to 2.1, the confidence interval for 1.5 2 to 2.1 does not contain 1. So that's significant at the alpha equal 0.05 level. But 
relative risk of 1.2 where the confidence interval is 0.7 to 1.3. See, that contains 1 in the middle. So then this relative risk is not significant, meaning there is no significant difference between those with the risk and those without the risk. Okay. Um, another type of analysis you might do is linear regression. This is when you have an independent variable X and dependent variable Y that are both continuous. And similar to correlation in that we're analyzing two variables, but um, the goal is to model these two variables as a line. Okay? Now, you all know your line um, formats or formula from your days in algebra, but it'll take, in, take on the MX plus B format. I've denoted as beta 0 plus beta 1X. Okay? Um, what you're doing is that the data points that you have from your sample are, are points on an XY plane. And you're going to use something called the method of least squares to find a line that fits well. Okay? A typical graph might be the one you see. So what do we mean by fits well? Well, we can talk about fit in terms of various distances from um, points to the lines. Okay? So this graph you have here, I'm going to try to go over with my mouse here. This horizontal line you see is y bar, so that's the sample mean of y from your sample. Okay? Now, why that's important is if you had no information about x, if you just had y, which is your outcome variable, your dependent variable, okay, the best guess or best estimate that you can come up with is y bar because you have no other information. So the best guess at the mean of the y's is y bar. Regression says, well, wait, wait, if you have different x's, you're going to have different values of y. Let's incorporate that into a model. So we're going to draw this line here that represents a regression line that incorporates um, various x's and acknowledges the fact that for various different x's, you're going to have different values of y. Okay? Um, but why this line rather than any other line? Well, that has to do with minimizing the distance between the uh, line and the point here. Okay? And so if we minimize these distances, then we should have the best line. Okay? I'm not going to go into how method of least squares works, um, but the method of least squares is used to find one unique line that fits your data well. Um, based on that line, you can calculate something called the coefficient of determination, R squared. It quantifies how much variability is explained. So statistics is about explaining variability. It's about sorting out the noise uh, from what's actually happening in the data. Okay? And so R squared is a quantity between 0 and 1, which tells us the percentage or the proportion of variation that's explained. If we explain a lot of variation, you'll have a higher R squared, closer to 1. If you don't explain much variation, you're going to have an R squared um, close to 0. Okay? You're never going to explain all the variation, but for the line, for linear regression to work, you want your R squared to be higher. There is a relationship between the sample correlation coefficient, so correlation coefficient and R squared, in that if you square the sample correlation coefficient, you'll get R squared. The main parameter of interest in regression is the slope beta 1. Okay? Beta 1 tells us the relationship between X and Y. And remember those two questions that we're interested in. Is there an effect? And if so, how much or what is that effect? So beta 1 tells us both of those things. Okay? If beta 1 is greater than 0, then x and y are directly proportional, so they're positively correlated or positively associated. If beta 1 is negative, then x and y are inversely proportional or they're negatively associated. Whereas beta 1, if beta 1 is 0, then y and x are not dependent on each other, so there's no association. Okay? So if we conduct a hypothesis test about the beta 1, then we can tell whether the difference 
point, um, away from zero is significant, in which case there will be some sort of association, and then the sign of beta 1 will tell us whether that's a positive association or negative association. Now, you can analyze beta 0 as a parameter as well, the intercept, um, but we usually don't. That doesn't tell us much about the, the relationship between the two variables. Okay, so you use linear regression when you have a continuous x and a continuous y. Very often times, though, in public health, your dependent variable y is not going to be continuous. Rather, it's going to be dichotomous. So someone has the disease or not, that's a dichotomous variable. Okay, so we want a way to analyze a dependent variable that's dichotomous, yet not restricting our independent variable to be categorical. Because remember, we had a two by two contingency table where X and Y were both dichotomous. We know how to handle those, we can do either relative risk or odds ratio. But in the case that the dependent variable is dichotomous, but the independent variable might be continuous, we need another method. And that method is uh, oftentimes, uh, what's the most common is the logistic regression. Okay, just a little bit of math here, but we model the probability of P of getting a one. So we model the probability of success, okay, using um, your regression format of beta zero plus beta one X, okay. This is very popular in public health because you can show that once you've got your estimates, if you do E to the beta one, so E is your exponential function, so E to the beta one, that's equivalent to the odds ratio when x increases by one unit. Okay, so beta one represents the change in log odds when x changes by one unit. So e to the beta one is the odds ratio between x and x plus one. Multiple regression. So for any regression, whether it be logistic regression or linear regression, um, you can add more independent variables to the model. Okay, Why we want to add independent variables? Because we might have confounders. If we have confounders, then we need to control those in the model. Okay, If we want to control those in the model, uh, we should include those as independent variables. Any regression model, linear regression or multiple uh, logistic regression, we can incorporate uh, these independent variables by adding them to the model. So instead of just having beta 1 x1, you're going to have additional terms, beta 2 times x2 plus beta 3 plus x3 times so on, or beta 3 times x3 plus so on. Okay. Same thing for logistic um, regression. Okay. The other type of analysis that you might encounter is called survival analysis. Let me go a little bit more detail into this because I understand some of you have not had survival analysis. So survival analysis is a collection of statistical procedures used for outcome that is time until an event. By time, what we mean is years, months, weeks, days, uh, from the beginning of the follow-up until the event for an individual occurs. Okay, it's a time until event. So we would like to know from the time we start observing them, when does the event occur? Alternatively, time may refer to the age of an individual. So you might start observing someone um, from birth or from some age until the event occurs. So instead of um, months, weeks, or years, like time, you might just look at their age. An event means anything that's of interest to you. So it could mean death, and that's the original application of survival analysis. They were looking at mortality. Um, but it could be disease incidents, right? How long does it take for someone to develop a disease? It could be something like relapse from remission. It could be recovery. It could be how long you take to go back to work after a work-related injury. Okay. It could be anything that measures time until some event occurs. Um, and here, event means only one thing. So we're talking about uh, one particular event, does that occur or not? 
Here are some applications of survival analysis that I've encountered. Um, a classic application is we follow leukemia patients in remission over several weeks to see how long they stay in remission. Uh, another study that follows a disease-free cohort of individuals over several years to see who develops heart disease. Uh, a parolee's time until rearrest, or a heart transplant patient's time until death. Okay. Now, when you're dealing with time or time to event data, you encounter a unique situation or a unique uh, problem called censoring. Censoring occurs when the exact time is unknown. Okay? Why does that happen? Okay, well, there might be three reasons. If you start a study, but the study ends before an individual actually experiences the event. So, for example, you're watching leukemia patients uh, who are in remission until they go out of remission. But you observe them for months, and it's the end of your study, but they're still in remission. The event never happened. Okay? That's not to say that after you stop observing them, the event will not occur, because it might. But you have no way of knowing whether the event occurred or not. So that's a common censoring. Another reason is an individual's loss to follow-up, right? So you're following up someone like a parolee, but the parolee flees to another state, and you lose contact. So you don't know if he has been rearrested or not, but he might not be or he might be, but he's lost to follow-up, so you have no way of knowing. Okay? So you don't know if the event occurred or what time, at what time it occurred or an individual is withdrawn from the study. Okay? So this could happen, for example, if you're following people in a disease-free cohort until they develop some disease, but one person has a car accident and dies. Okay? So that person never experiences the event, but their time stops because they're dead. Right? So they ne never develop heart disease, but they have to be withdrawn from the study because the event can't happen. This could also happen if someone's in a clinical trial or something and they choose, they voluntarily withdraw. So they say they don't want to be in the clinical trial anymore um, and the event hasn't occurred. So you lose them um, for the study and you have no way of knowing whether the event occurred or not. There's three types of censoring, right censoring, left censoring, and interval censoring. Most survival data are right censored, so that is we know when the survival time starts, okay, but we don't know when or if the event occurs, okay, usually due to one of the three reasons we mentioned above. There could be situations where some data is left censored. So this is when you don't know when time started, right? It's usually when you start observing them from study, but for example, if you're looking at the survival of someone who is HIV positive, then their time really should start the first time they're infected with HIV, not when you start observing them, right? Or even if you have that information prior to your study, that person might only be able to tell you when they were first tested rather than when they actually was infected with the uh, HIV. Okay, so that would be left censoring when you don't know when survival time starts. Uh, interval censoring is when the exact time of the event is unknown. So you were observing them, but the event occurred, but you never took track of when this happened. So how does this happen? So you might be monitoring someone on a weekly basis. Okay, the event occurred in week three but you don't know if the event occurred on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Saturday. Okay? It occurred sometime during that week. So you don't have a clear count of when the event occurred. You just have an interval where the event occurred. So that's why that's called interval sensory. Okay. Graphically, it looks like this. Okay? So going from the very top, um, or let's start. So the blue line on the left is when your study starts. The blue line on the right is when the study ends. Okay? You can only start observing people from the start of your study, and you do. You start observing. When 
the event occurs, so that's the X, within the two blue lines, you know exactly when the event occurred. Those are not censored observations. However, if the event occurs after the study, or they never experience the event, either during the study or the after, then they're right censored because you can only analyze data up to the end of your study because that's all you know, but the event might or might not have occurred after your study ended. Um, left censoring occurs when um, you started observing them when you started the study, but their time could have started before. And then interval censoring, um, you know that the event happened sometime in the middle, but you lost track of when that actual event occurred. So why do we use survival analysis? The general goal of survival analysis is to analyze what we call the survival experience of the population of interest. Okay? Survival experience is captured by a survival function or a survival curve. Okay? In theory, survival curves are continuous and smooth. So if we were to graph the survival experience of everybody in our population, everyone would be event free at the beginning, but over time it's assumed that everyone will experience the event, okay, theoretically. But practically when we actually do the study, there's a beginning to the study and there's an end to the study. So not everyone will experience the event. So instead of a smooth curve, what we're going to do is a step curve, and this is called the Kaplan-Meier curve or Kaplan-Meier estimator. What happens in this graph is the graph starts at 100% because everyone is incident-free or event-free at the beginning. You observe them during your study, and at a certain point, someone's going to experience the event. At that point, the number of people who are still event-free reduces to this much here, the next horizontal line. Again, you observe them for some time, and at a certain point, another person or two experiences the event, and the percentage of people who are event-free goes down. This continues until the end of your study, where certain certain number of people have experienced the event and certain number of people have not. Okay? If everyone experiences the event, this step function will go down to zero. Okay? But oftentimes in most studies, not everyone will experience the event, so it will end with uh, a non-zero percentage here. Okay? Whenever there are more, more than one um, person or observation that experiences the event, the step is actually higher. So you see that this step here, where I'm pointing to now, is higher than the step here, the next step. That means that this higher step, at this time where this higher step occurred, more people experienced the event than this lower point. A common application of survival analysis is to compare survival experiences of two groups. Okay? So the example I have is um, time until remission for leukemia patients, one receiving a new treatment, other receiving standard of care. So let's say the pink line above here is for the treatment group. So in the treatment group, not everyone uh, experienced uh, went out of remission. But in the standard care group, everyone eventually went out of remission. Okay. We want a way to compare these. So we can certainly compare this visually, which is what we're doing now, and we might be able to tell that the treatment group is doing better than the uh, standard treatment standard group. However, we want a statistical way of comparing that. Okay? And to do that, what we use is something called a log rank test. So the null hypothesis would be that the survival curves are the same. If the survival curves are the same, then their survival experiences are about the same. Versus the alternative that the survival curves are different. Okay? So if they're different, then their survival experiences are different. 
we can compare these curves using a log rank test. And if the test rejects, the curves are significantly different. The method works for more than two groups as well. So if you had three or more survival curves, you can tell whether or not, or you can test whether or not all survival experiences are the same versus at least one is different. The thing to keep in mind is that the log rank test can tell you whether the survival experiences are different. It can't tell you which one is better. To tell which one is better, you have to either visually observe the survival curves, right? For the leukemia example, the treatment group was on top, so that's doing better. Or you have to calculate descriptive statistics like mean or median survival times um, to tell you which group is doing better. The log rank test only tells you whether or not whether they're different or not. All right. So in the last few minutes, let me talk about the miscellaneous topics that we have for statistics. These um, can be included in descriptives or inferential. I just kept them sort of separate. First thing is reliability and validity. Okay. So the reliability of a measurement is the overall consistency of a measure. So a measure has high reliability if similar results are produced under similar conditions. A common value to quantify reliability is Cronbach's alpha. Cronbach's alpha varies from 0 to 1. The higher it is or closer it is to 1, the more reliable or more internal consistency there is. And lower it is, there's less internal consistency. High reliability does not necessarily mean the measure is accurate, i.e. not necessarily valid. Okay. Validity of a measurement is the assessment of the degree to which a measure represents what it's supposed to be measuring. Measure could be reliable but not valid. So I'll give you a very uh, sort of a trivial example but an example nonetheless. Suppose a person weighs 200 pounds, that's their true weight, and this person gets on a scale 20 times, the same scale 20 times. Each time he gets on the scale, the scale reads 250 pounds. Okay? So under the same condition 20 times, the scale read 250 pounds every single time. So this scale is actually very reliable. It's very consistent. It gives you similar results under similar conditions all the time. However, because he weighs 200 pounds and not 250 pounds, it's not measuring his true weight. So this measure or this scale is actually not valid. Okay? So in general, an unreliable measure cannot be valid because if it's all over the place, then um, you're not going to have an accurate measure. Okay. Validity is harder than reliability to attain, um, but for you to know that you're measuring the right thing, you need validity, not necessarily just reliability. Another important concept, confounding variable, or just simply confounding. This is an extraneous variable that distorts the true effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. Graphically, it looks like this. So what you want is the relationship between x and y. How does the exposure affect the outcome y? However, what a confounder does is that it affects both x and y, and the true relationship between x and y is masked. So for example, um, high, excuse me, for example, high calorie intake may be associated to high BMI. So people who eat more might have a higher BMI. But a, B, a confounder might be the amount of physical activity that person does because someone might eat a lot, but they might actually exercise a lot, so their BMI might not be as high. Ways of controlling confounding. So the most straightforward way to control confounding is stratification. So what stratification means is you conduct a separate analysis for each level of a confounding variable. Okay? That is one analysis for only males and another for females, example. Okay? You think um, by combining males and females in an analysis, it will give you results that's not accurate. So what you're going to do is a study of males and study of females. 
and conclude for males and females separately. The advantage is that um, it's clear what you're doing and um, you can clearly see the effect after the confounding is removed. Right? If you only have males in one group and you're just doing an analysis on males, then uh, gender is no longer a confounder because there are no females in the group and vice versa. Okay? The disadvantage is that you need a large enough sample size for each strata to have enough subjects. Right? So you need enough males and females, for example, to do an analysis both on males and females. Um, if you have a continuous confounder, you need to categorize that confounder because you can't separate them out into groups. Okay? Um, and it's also difficult to control when there are multiple confounders. Right? So if you think both uh, race, which has four categories, uh, white, black, Hispanic, and other, as well as um, gender, which has male and female, both are confounders, then you have to have a group for white males, white females, black males, black females, and so on, which may create the problem of you don't have enough subjects in each of the strata. So when you have multiple confounders, probably a better way to control for confounding is to include the confounding variables as additional independent variables in regression. Okay? So this is a somewhat of a crude writing of the regression model, but you have the dependent variable, which you are uh, modeling, that's the y, equaling to the intercept plus beta 1 times the main independent variable. So that's your main factor of interest, plus uh, any other confounders that you might have. The advantage here is that you can control for more than one confounder, um, and confounders can either be continuous or categorical. All right, effect modifiers. So if I, effect modification occurs when the effect of an independent variable on the dependent variable differs depending on the level of the third variable. Okay? This is different from confounding. Okay? So look at the example that I have. So in the first graph where men and women have um, parallel lines, okay? Although they start at different points, and so the height of the graphs are different, as x increases, y increases in the same manner for both men and women. So in a sense, the, no matter which level of gender you're in, man or woman, the effect of x on y is the same. So there is no effect modification here. However, if you look at the second graph, you see that um, men actually grow at a higher rate than women, right? Women actually start at a higher point on the y-axis, but as you move further down on the axis, the men exceed the women in whatever we're measuring here, right? So the rate of growth or the slope for men is actually higher than women, okay? So though depending on which level of gender you're in, men or women, the effect of x on y is different. This is a classic case of effect modification. And we would say that the effect modifier here is gender. To model such relationships um, in a regression model, what we would use is something called an interaction model, where instead of just addition, we would include a multiplicative uh, term in the regression model. In this case, it would be x times gender. Right. Several other things, counting distribution. Um, we already talked about binomial distribution and Poisson distribution. Okay. Binomial distribution models the number of events out of n observations. Poisson distribution models the number of events out of an infinite, in theory, observations. So they're both counting distributions. You're always counting the number of events that occurred. In practice, though, the number of observations will not be infinite. Right? So in, in practice, you're always going to have a finite number or a finite time set, etc. So when do you use, use Poisson and when do you use binomial? Okay. General rule of thumb says that the Poisson is appropriate when you have a rare event. Now, what's considered rare? That's arbitrary. 
but when you have a rare event, it's probably more appropriate to use a Poisson distribution than a binomial distribution. Um, and that's all I have um, for today's lecture. I hope that helped in clarifying some of your questions. I will entertain any questions um, either about the second half or anything um, that we have discussed today. Um, if a 20 is, wait, I'm sorry, um, if mean is 20 and standard deviation for, then how to calculate probability for some specific observation, for example, p, and then in parentheses, x is greater than 25? So if you have, assuming your observations come from a normal distribution with um, mean 20 and standard deviation 4, to calculate the probability, what you'll do is standardize the x. So you'll do x minus the mean divided by standard deviation. That will give you a z-score. The z-score has a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. Um, to calculate the other side, so you want to know whether x is greater than 25. Probability x is greater than 25. So you do 25 minus 20 divided by 4. Um, and get a number there. You would find that number corresponding on a normal table or z-score table, and then you can find the probability by calculating the area to the right uh, of that distribution curve. It's difficult to explain in words, but um, essentially you want to standardize it and then use your z-table to calculate the probability. Could you explain the p-value again? Sure. Uh, the p-value represents the probability of observing something or something more unusual given that the null hypothesis is true. So let me give you a very simple example. So if you think that um, the city where you live, the average BMI is 25. Okay, so the mean BMI for your city is 25. That's what you assume. So that's the null hypothesis. Okay, now you observe your observations and calculate a bunch of people's BMI from your city and you end up that the actual BMI you observed in your city is x bar equals 20. So from your um, sample, you calculate that your sample or mean BMI is 20. Okay? P-value tells you, well, in a city where the average BMI is 25, how likely are you to see a mean of 20 given your sample? Okay? If that chances is fairly high, that means that 20 is within the realm of possibility even if the mean BMI in your city is 25. If the p-value is low, you can interpret it by saying, well, the mean BMI in my city is probably not 25, so my assumption, my null hypothesis is probably not correct, and you can reject. The p-value indicates that probability of how likely your observation is under the null hypothesis. Can, you, uh, can survival analysis be used to calculate multiple points in time? For example, if a treatment program, uh, in a treatment program, a client is assessed and is, and it is estimated they will re remain in treatment for 90 days. However, they will end up, however, they end up spending more than 90 days in the program. So I, th I think I get the question. So, uh, yes, if if you are, survival analysis is just looking for an event to occur. So however long you are observing them where they don't experience the event, that is the entire survival time. 
Okay. Now, if your study is supposed to last only 90 days, but you observe them further, um, that's a change in protocol, so that may introduce other biases. However, from a purely analytical standpoint, um, as long as you have observation or you can observe a person throughout the time from the start to whenever you end, whether that's 90 or beyond, and you can observe whether they experienced an event or not, yes, you can analyze that. What you can't do, however, is if you are looking for two events. For example, if you are looking for someone to get a heart attack and a stroke, you can't look for both in the same analysis. The event has to be just one event. Okay, Shumi, I don't see any other questions, but if anyone has questions, they can email you, correct? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you, Sumi, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today as the National Board of Public Health Examiners presented our last in our series of six webinars geared to explaining the domain areas of public health to help you prepare for the upcoming CPH exam. These webinars will be um, have been recorded and they will be placed on the uh, MBPHE website for future viewing. Um, Thank you, Sumi, and uh, you should receive, if you registered for this uh, webinar, you'll receive an email with a link to um, the recording as well as Sumi's um, contact information. So thank you and have a great day and good luck on the exam.